Well, maybe we should just start till Natasha has the PowerPoint there. It's up. So, Natasha, thank you for, for helping out with us. And we just got a screen there right in the front. We'll say this out at the top that if you do have a question, we love to engage. This is live for those of you who are listening in. So you can ask a question there or chat down the sidebar. There is a beautiful picture of me and Corey. And clearly, oh, you know, yeah. beards are in, Corey. Like, if you had your first... <laughs> Great. Uh, you know, I had to follow. So, so yeah, for those of you who don't, look at uh, yeah. <laughs> for those <laughs> of you who don't know, Corey, yeah, Corey and I are really good friends for a long time. Probably seven, you know, six or seven years. Corey and I have shared a friendship, a love for music. We've holidayed together, had our families together, and and uh, done some music together. In fact, it was probably six or seven years ago I was playing on the stage with Corey and he had these click and rhythm tracks going on and I was like, man, these sound really great. I bet you other churches could use them. And so we started producing them and since then hundreds and thousands of downloads of these click and audio tracks have been really helping a lot of churches. So that's been awesome. And uh, yeah. and I should say, I think this is really cool that Corey is the worship pastor at North Langley Community Church, which is the same seat that I held back in 1994 to 99. Those were the early days of worship ministry for me. And it was actually the church where I got the whole idea about praise charts. And uh, I had the worship team there and was lacking in music resources and started this little thing on the side. And so so since then, I moved on in 1999. And Corey, what year did you start? Probably several years later, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been there for nine years now. So that would have been, wow. yeah, back in what, 2005, I guess, somewhere around there? Yeah, that's awesome. So you've really uh, carried the torch very well and seen the church grow and deepen. And I always love coming back to... Uh, I always feel like North Langley is like my, you know, heart home church. And when I come there, I feel very welcome and uh, and love seeing what you're doing there. So so that's oh, awesome. Yeah. So, Corey, you've had a super busy week this last couple of weeks releasing your album. And I just want to take a few minutes. Uh, we won't spend a ton of time on this, but uh, the album Lost and Found uh, just came out. And I'm sure that's been an incredible journey for you, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how long this has been in the works and how excited you are about all this new music you've just released. Yeah, it, it's been a real, uh, a real dream come true for me. I think it's something that I always wanted to, uh, I've always wanted to do, and I think I've always just sort of talked myself out of it, or, or felt as though, man, I don't have, I don't have enough songs that are good enough. And uh, so mm-hmm. finally, it was, it was time for a sabbatical um, this last year for my church, and and my lead pastor is also a good friend of mine, Matthew. Uh, really encouraged me and said, man, it's, it's time for you to do an album. You've got to get your songs out there. And so I kind of planned on that um, as, as part of, a big part of my sabbatical was to record this album. And uh, so Lost and Found is a collection of uh, about nine tracks, nine songs that I've written uh, over the years, over the last number of years. Uh, it includes probably like uh, four, three or four worship songs, songs that we could, we could sing as a community, as a kind of a corporate worship um, but then also it's got about, yeah, about five other songs that are more uh, just, just kind of journey songs and songs that I've written out of my own kind of life experience. And uh, I'm really proud of it. Yeah, we just, we just had our big CD release uh, concert this last Sunday night, and it went really well. And uh, I just, yeah, pretty excited about it. Right on. Well, I, you know, I must say, even though you're a very good friend, and I might be biased towards it, when I would uh, stuck it in my eye, my iPhone and was listening to the album, I was super impressed with the the quality of the sound, the arrangements, you know, everything like that, the songs, great lyrics, good messages, good flow through it. So um, I really, really enjoyed it and encouraged many of you. uh, You can listen online. It's streaming for free. You can download the charts for free. And there's some really great worship songs, a couple in particular. Maybe we'll just talk about one or two in particular that are especially good for the church, we're just looking at Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, which is a very yeah. well-known hymn. But man, you nailed it with your arrangement of this song. Mm-hmm. Very, very singable and a beautiful track to to listen to. So just tell us about a couple of these songs. How about this one, uh, Oh, the Deep, Deep Love of Jesus, why you, you love that hymn and, 
and uh, made it a part of your album. Sure. Yeah, I've I've always loved this hymn. I think what I love about Oh the Deep Deep Love is that it's a uh, it's this gorgeous hymn that's speaking of the love of Jesus, and yet it's this it's got a very it's kind of a moody kind of sound to it. It's in the minor key, and it's very it's just got mm-hmm. this um I don't know what it is that I love about it. I always I uh, I think of um you know when we think of love often I was sharing this at our CD release thing that we sometimes think of a kind of a, a light fluffy kind of, you know, nice white clouds, you know, kind of love. But, but when we think about mm-hmm. the love of Jesus, I think it's so much deeper and so much stronger than that. And to me, this song, lyrically as well as musically, it actually really conveys that well. And it's something that I've loved about the song. And so I thought, hey, it'd be so cool to do, to do a hymn on this album. I love good hymns, mm-hmm. especially when they're done well. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so we did this track, and I kind of, I think I tried to be reflective of that, that strength and that, that kind of... Um, you know, that, that strong love in the way that we arranged the song. And I have this great cellist, Brian Chan, who you met, Ryan, on, on Sunday night, and he's just fantastic, a fantastic cellist. And so he kind of, he had a lot to this track. Um, I think of Rich Mullins. Rich Mullins talks about, uh, in one of his songs, he, he, I think the line is, the restless raging fury that they call the love of God. And I think in a way I was trying to capture that in, um, in this song and in the, the intro hook and the way we kind of do it quite aggressively. Um, but anyways, yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of that track, and I think it's, uh, it's just, it's a beautiful hymn, and so it was a real awesome privilege to be able to put it on the, uh, on the album. Yep, awesome, great moments in that, great moments on the CD, and a couple of other wonderful songs. As your kingdom comes, it's a good song about the, um, the beatitudes, really drawn from scripture. That's right, Psalm 121, yeah. uh, you know, a song about the Maker coming from, right from the Psalms, really singable and uh, just to want to encourage people to take that in and and also I think the reason why I just wanted to say this is every worship leader out there you know probably has something in his heart about could I ever record put something out you know I'm not signed by a big publisher and all that kind of stuff and we really live in an era where it becomes possible and you were kind of like that person Corey that it's like you've never really done this. You're not really a traveling, touring artist, but you have, uh, you know, a gathering of people that you shepherd and pastor as a worship pastor, and this has become a real extension of that ministry for you. So I think you want to just be an encouragement to other people to say, you know, if you've got some songs and you have a gift like that, that it's really worth it to take the time and, and record them and, and do all of that. Hey, Corey? Totally. Yeah, you know, that's very true. And I think for me, it was a big part of it was just having someone, having people around me encouraging me. And that was, that was a big part because I think we always, especially as musicians, I think we tend to second guess ourselves. And we, you know, we might think, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, Chris Tomlin or I'm not Lincoln Brewster or I'm not Paul Balash. But, mm-hmm. you know, having, I think God's given you and God's given me a voice for the community that he's put me in. And so that was a big goal for me was just to say, you know, if nothing else, I, I want this album to be like a blessing to our community here in, in Langley. And, I knew that there were people that were kind of behind me with it, and um, that helps too. I think the biggest thing for me was to find a great, a great kind of partner in it, and, and Ryan McAllister mm-hmm. who produced the album. That was a key thing for me to find someone that could take kind of my ideas and say, "Hey, let's let's we can we can go even further with this," and I can, you know, someone that will be able to translate what you bring, what you're bringing, uh, into something. Yeah, just sa- that sounds really mm-hmm. awesome, and that uh, yeah. So it was it's been yeah, a fantastic really process, and, yeah, for sure. Awesome. And then Corey and I went down to the river, which is about five minutes from where he lives, and recorded these videos, one for each of the songs, and told the story about the songs. So those are all on YouTube. It gives a little bit of a background there. You can go into Praise Charts as well, as you see on the screen. And so it's nice to have a bit of uh, the heart and soul behind those songs. And again, that's another thing I think I was really trying to encourage Corey when he did this album, to say, let's just go out you know, basically you take the iPhone and, you know, we had like a cheap camcorder, you know, and, a, and an iPhone and put a nice little video together that told the story of the songs. And, um, and I think it's a it's really nice uh, way to, to capture your heart with all of that. So way to go, cool. Corey. Congratulations yeah. to Thanks, you man. for that and all that you put in. And I know I am super encouraged by seeing you do that. So we want to talk now about worship rehearsals. This is the, you know, that time either middle of the week or desperately one hour before Sunday morning services or whenever you all have that time, you know, to answer the question, can we pull this together? 
as a band. Sometimes you come together as a band and, you know, people don't even know each other. Or other times they've been playing together for years. There might be personality issues going on. You know, some people, there's musicians all over the place. Uh, some are super skillful. Some are less than skillful. There's so many dynamics to uh, think about. And as a worship pastor, you land on the stage and you're like, how am I going to pull this group together in the next couple of hours so that we can um, play on Sunday morning? So, Corey, you are the one that brought this topic to me. Why, why is this something that you wanted to talk about? Why do you think it's important to, you know, to think about how to pull off a really great worship rehearsal? What's in it for you? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I just, I have a, a growing kind of passion for, uh, just for pursuing excellence in our worship. And I think, you know, for me, part of it came from just like a, a what, what felt like a need that was growing around me. And I, I had a number of conversations in the last six months, just of, of guys and, and pastors at churches that are saying, like, how do you like, you know, I feel like our musicians, they've got great hearts for worship, really good people. They love Jesus. They they, you know, they want to serve him, but they just don't, they don't really have the tools, and, and worship doesn't sound great on Sunday morning. It doesn't really, it's somehow, some, there's a miss here. And so they were like, how do we, like, how do we, not even talking as much about the theology of worship or the, you know, the, the heart of worship, but how do we actually, just the practical side of things, how do we get a good rehearsal? How do we, um, you know, make sure that we've got something that's, that's um, bringing people into, uh, you know, the throne room of God, and that is, um, reflecting mm-hmm. God's beauty. How do we actually do that in a practical sense? And so for me, it just made me, it was good. I, I, so I've spoken at a couple different things about that at different events. And I, I just, it kind of forced me to sit down and write out like, yeah, what do I, you know, when I'm, when I'm preparing for a rehearsal, when I'm running a rehearsal, what are the things that are important to me? How do I make sure that we are offering, you know, the best that we've got um, to our community and to the Lord on a Sunday morning? And so that's, that's kind of where this came from. I just, I kind of jotted down a bunch of ideas and I've done a couple of different clinics on this and it's, uh, it's, like I said, it's a growing passion for me. All right. So I'm ready to dive in. We've got a whole bunch of points, and they're super great, very practical. There's the first one right up there. So tell us what, uh, what you mean by band and worship leaders need to lead with a capital L. <laughs> that's right, in, in yellow for that matter. Yes. Um, that's right. You know, I think this, and maybe this feels like a no-brainer to everyone, um, but it's, I think it's, it's not necessarily. And so I think when I say that, um, my big thing is like, you know, take, if, you are, if you're the worship leader, if you're the band leader, uh, take that role seriously. I think, um, again, often we, we maybe we second-guess ourselves um, as leaders, and maybe you're in a situation where you're in a church and you're, you know, you're, you're supposed to run a rehearsal, but you've got, you've got people on your team that are older than you, that have more experience musically than you do, and you just feel kind of like ah, a little sheepish about it. I think my encouragement is to say, you know what, if you're called to lead, then you have to lead. You've just got to take that role seriously. Mm-hmm. And again, I've had others that have said, well, we don't really have a leader. You know, we, we kind of get together and we just kind of jam and we work it out, and then Sunday morning it, it kind of <laughs> comes together. You know, and I'm like, well, maybe... Maybe it comes together, and that's great, but I, I'm convinced that uh, the best possible outcome is going to come from having a strong leader, or at least a leader who's being really intentional about what he or she is looking for in a rehearsal. And, you know, I remember when I was uh, probably 17 years old, and I was leading one of my first experiences leading a band, and I was um, very new at it. I was a decent musician, but, you know, I had like, you know, I suffered from ageism, you know, that uh, condition where you're like, oh, everyone around me is older, and they're yeah, more experienced. Yeah. Who, who am I, right? Who am I to lead this band? And so I remember being really passive in my, in my leadership, and I was, you know, kind of like, well, guys, what do you think? Like, what, let's try this, and, you know, what do you think of that? Is that, does that sound, does that make sense? Is that good? Or, no, maybe not. Maybe we should try, you know, and just kind of stuttering through the rehearsal. And finally, the, this bass player who had far more experience than me and he had a Bachelor of Music and I remember being like, oh my goodness, like he's way better musician than I am. He finally was like, Corey, like he was getting annoyed. He's like, will you just lead us? Like you're the guy who's supposed to, can you just lead us? And it was a real important um, kind of moment for me and I've often looked back on that as a turning point where I recognize, you know what, just because you're the leader, what it's, what, that's actually not saying that you're necessarily the strongest musician in the group. It's not about a stature thing or a status mm-hmm. thing. It's a role that you've been called to play. And if you've been called to play the mm-hmm. role of leader, then you've got to take it seriously. We need a point person. We need someone that's going to plan out the rehearsal, someone that's going like, to think through the songs, they're going to think through the structure of the songs, the dynamics of the songs. They're going to think about how long the rehearsal is going to go, how should that rehearse? You know, like all that plan, make sure the charts are readable, make sure we've got good keys, 
um, just really aware of, of hopefully how this thing is going to go, and then being the point person, just kind of resting on that, uh, the leader's shoulder. So, I mean, we could talk for a long time about this, but that's, to me, it's a really important thing for us to take super intentionally. If you're the leader, make sure you're leading. Yeah, I think it's really good, Corey. I'm just thinking as I think about that point, and I think lots of people probably struggle with wanting to be humble, you know, like, like that Christian humility, I don't want to overbear people and I don't want to overtake or have too strong of a personality. And so it's that kind of internal battle that you go through. And yet at the same time, someone does need to say, okay, you know, just to have that kind of mindset and that purposefulness. And suddenly everybody even feels more at ease of going, okay, well, he is, he is taking this. I do actually... I have a memory of one time when I was leading uh, this big, you know, citywide thing, and I had another very strong worship leader who was um, who was with me, and I just remember him kind of making some, um, you know, comments during the practice, and I was like, wait a second, who's actually leading this? And I just had to decisively take some authority in the practice, like. This is the direction that I want to go, and, and it's not, it doesn't have to be a battle, and it's okay. In fact, it's a lot easier when someone does do that, so, so it's really good. It really is. As part of serving your community, right. yes. like that's, that, that helps yeah. as well, right? If you're thinking this is, this is for a bigger picture than just what we're doing right now. Yeah. Okay, number two. Right. Okay. Yep. Sometimes you just got to pick one sentence. <laughs> That's right. I think this is a, I kind of like, uh, I use this a lot and I just feel like, I think sometimes, you know, we, we can overthink things, especially when it comes to arrangements, right? Musical arrangements. And you're, you know, you've got an idea yeah. and then all of a sudden the guitarist is saying to you like, well, what, yeah, but what about like, what if we tried this? Cause I heard, you know, like in the, in the recording, I'm pretty sure that they do this. And, and you're like, oh shoot, you know, and you start second guessing yourself. Like my philosophy is, listen, there are like 150 right answers here. There really are. There's like so many right answers when you're arranging a song. Your job as the team leader is to pick one of them, right? Just be, again, being intentional and saying, yep. So the thing that that frees you up, uh, the area that frees you up in is that you're not necessarily saying, uh, no, guitarist, that's a horrible idea. (laughs) My idea is right and your idea is wrong. Actually, it's not what you're saying. What you're saying is like you could be saying, hey, that's a really cool idea. I think this time we're going to go with, with this. I actually have a, I kind of have a vision for how this is going to end up. So we're going to go with this. But that's cool. We, maybe we could try that next time or, or something or whatever. You don't have to say that. But the idea is just that, listen, we're not necessarily shutting down everything else as bad ideas. We're just saying there's lots of options here. We have to pick one of them. It's like mm-hmm. those, uh, remember those Choose Your Own Adventure books? I don't know if when you were in high school if you had those, but we had those. There's, there's lots of open doors here, and you get to decide which one you're going to go through. That's mm-hmm. the role of the leader. Yep, very good, very good. Okay, I'm going to keep us moving through. Some of these we'll settle more into. And, uh, so number sure. three, so start and end with an easy and accessible song. That's a good practical suggestion. Yeah, yeah, this is one of those things. Again, a lot of these are, uh, so, or some of these points are, are more subjective than others. This is what I have found um, is, is really helpful in my rehearsals. Like, again, I think through our rehearsals and I think about kind of how they're going to go. I'm thinking, okay, we've got like, you know, about two and a half hours here um, to rehearse. We've got about six songs to go through. So what I will often do is I'll want to start off um, on a good foot. You know, first impressions are lasting impressions. And so uh, yeah. when I'm thinking like, you know, hey, so chances are we've got, we've got a couple guys here who maybe, you know, maybe they're feeling a little intimidated. Maybe it's been a month since they've played. They're feeling a little nervous, a little bit, oh boy, you know, hope I do well. It's always helpful to start off on a good foot. And so to say, hey, let's, you know, for us it might be, this is Amazing Grace, let's say by Phil Wickham. Well, we've done that song a lot in the last couple of months. I think everyone on the team knows it really well. It's just a great thing to start off the rehearsal where we all kind of end the song and we're like, ah, oh, okay, you know what? That sounded good. That feels good. I think I played that well. Like, that sounds like, yeah, we're doing okay. And so just psychologically, it's like, okay, we're off into a good kind of, we've got a good vibe going here. Uh, we're feeling pretty good about ourselves. Um, it's just, it's a helpful tool as opposed to starting with something mm-hmm. that's just grueling and it's hard, it's unfamiliar, you know, you kind of end it, it's a bit rough, it's like, okay, well, it's, you know, and people are feeling a little less sure of themselves. I always think it's good to start on a good foot and then I, I kind of book in my rehearsals that way actually. So I'll start off with a song that, that we all know pretty well, that we know we're going to sound pretty good on, 
Uh, we do that. We feel great about it afterwards, and then we're off to the races. We're going to dig into some other stuff. And then at the end of the rehearsal, yeah. same thing. Like, I don't want to end with a song that is just going to be, I know it's going to be a tough one, because again, as a leader, I've thought it through. You know, the days before, I've been thinking through it. This is going to be a tough one. We've got to work hard at it. I'm actually going to, I'm going to end the rehearsal with a song that we're all familiar with, that we're going to, I know that we're going to play it pretty well. We're going to, you know, end the rehearsal and, and walk back, you know, out of the church into our homes, and we're going to feel good about the way things went. Because there's nothing mm-hmm. worse than having a great rehearsal, and then the last song kind of sucks. You know, <laughs> you're like, oh, I just, you know, everything was good, and then you kind of walk away, and you know, I used to say those, my Wednesday night rehearsals can make or break my week. And that, yeah. uh, you know, I don't think that's quite as true anymore. But maybe we've all experienced that when you, you know, you end rehearsal and it's like, oh, that last song, it's just like that did not come together very well. And then you kind of leave and everyone's feeling a little bit dejected and a little bit down. So instead, I'm like, hey, let's make, let's try to do our part to make sure that we are, we're feeling good about things. We feel like everything's in hand. We know what we're doing. We end with a good song. We feel good about it. We say, hey, we'll see you guys Sunday morning. And it's, yeah, it's just a good, I think it's a good practice to kind mm-hmm. of um, really keep things positive. I'm also thinking it's probably a good idea if you communicate to your band this intention because then, you know, if you tell them we're going to do this, then when you start into that first song, you know, they're not thinking, I already know this. So why are we practicing this song that we've done, you know, 10,000 times? And, and if they realize that the intention of it is, to pull the band together, even to just start on a note of worship. Like, we're not really practicing this song. We're, we're just entering into a spirit of worship here with a song that hopefully you're familiar with and setting a tone and creating that tone. So, so I think totally. that's also and it, good. It serves a number of roles. Like, I think that's exactly like what you're saying, Ryan. And it, and it, it serves mm-hmm. that role. It can also serve like even a sound check kind of role too, right? For the, right. For the sound, you know, whoever's your sound guy. So he has a chance to be like, okay, they're playing... The band is playing confidently here. Uh, you know, I know this is kind of this is this is the height at which they're going to play. They're going to be, you know, everyone's digging in pretty good. So he can do a good sound. He or she can do a good sound check. It, I think it's just a. It, there's a positive side, a number of positive sides to it. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got a few questions coming in, so I think I'm going to intersperse them if that's all right. I'm going to put you on the spot, Natasha. We won't go into number four quite yet. Uh, so Cameron asks. Would you make any adjustments to a successful rehearsal when working with teenagers? Oh, cool. I'm just trying to find that here, actually. I see Cameron now. Uh, okay, cool. Um, sorry, and the question I don't see here, but the, the question that's was... That's all right. I've got the questions. I've got the questions coming in to me. So, um, yeah, he just... And I know, Corey, you have worked with younger kids, uh, even your own kids, you know, 10, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, but... Uh, youth worship teams going on. So how do the dynamics maybe change with younger folks? Oh, yeah, totally. You have to, I mean, in some ways this will tie into another point we're going to talk about in a little bit as well. Mm. But definitely, I think that I will always be thinking about the context that I'm going to be in. Um, and so yeah. if I'm going to be going into a rehearsal with like this last, so for this last weekend, for instance, with the CD release party, um, like I knew that I was working with like top-notch musicians, like my expectations of how the rehearsal is going to go is very, very different than if I'm heading into a rehearsal with our, our Ignite group, which is our grade six to eight uh, younger yeah. um, group here in our church. And so, yeah, you have to be realistic about your rehearsal. You have to think through, uh, like, so I may, not, uh, I may not pick a song in the key of D flat, you know, if I'm doing um, a rehearsal yeah. with these guys that are, that are younger, right? You're thinking, okay, these are maybe some greener musicians here. Um, again, my goal in those situations, and I think as, as I get older, maybe a lot of us, like, you, you know, I have a real heart for these, for younger musicians that are just starting out. And I want them to feel just, I want them to feel great about what they're offering and what they're doing. And so I'm going to do my part as a band leader to make sure that we are feeling like, hey, this is, this is a great offering. Like, we're doing something really good here. We're making something beautiful together. So mm-hmm. I would be very intentional about thinking through the arrangements, nothing super complex. I would say, and by the way, like, I think complexity doesn't necessarily mean awesome, right? It just means complex. And that can be a good thing or not so good of a thing. And so I would think let's go a little bit simpler with the arrangements. Let's, uh, mm-hmm. let's make this really accessible for the musicians. Let's, let's set everyone up to win as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, totally. So that's what I would be. I'd be definitely thinking that way. For sure, I'd be adjusting depending on who I'm working with. Well, that's a great segue into your number four, plan your rehearsal in terms of complexity of arrangements. So uh, totally. that's kind of what you were thinking there. That's right. Yeah, I, like, 
I think, and this is, I think, has become more and more of a big deal to me. Like, when I, again, when I'm thinking through my Wednesday night rehearsal, we rehearse on Wednesday nights, um, or whenever, depending on what the context is, I'm always thinking about, okay, so we've got about two and a half hours here to rehearse together. Probably, you know, we start at 7.30, but chances are we won't actually get started until, you know, quarter two or ten to uh, eight. Um, so I've got just over, yeah, say two hours to rehearse. Uh, I've got six songs. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking to myself, I've got really cool, super fun, crazy, different arrangements for every song, it's going to be awesome, I'm probably setting myself up to lose, right? Because it's like, well, that's going to take time, you know? And I think with, you know, the more and more experience we get, the more we realize, okay, like it might be in my head and my heart and I had time to work this arrangement out, but I now have to make sure that these six musicians are going to be able to do this well, right? Because we, we want to play well. We want them to feel great about what they're doing. So uh, bottom line is I will very rarely have more than, say, three of those songs with interesting, kind of unique, complex arrangements. I'm not going to go into the rehearsal with six, the six songs and doing it differently. So the other three songs, like let's say, you know, let's say I'm taking three songs that we do normally. I might say, hey guys, so this song we're going to do pretty straightforward, pretty much kind of what you hear in the recording. We're going to, we're going to stick to that. Maybe one little thing we're going to change here. Let's just try this out. Um, but it's pretty straightforward. I know that, you know, 10 minutes is probably going to do it. 10, 15 minutes. We'll go through it once and a half. We'll, we'll go through it. You know, if there's any problem sections, we'll go through that. But, you know, unless something goes really weird, we should, be, we should be good to go in 10, 15 minutes on to the next song. Now, the next song, let's say we're like, hey, I've got this great, this cool idea. I think it'll be really neat to do, uh, you know, Come Thou Found, let's say, uh, that hymn. And we want to do, I want to just try something very different with this, and, and I think it'll be a cool kind of, um, you know, a di- idea for it, but it's going to take some time. Well, then I've got, you know, it's like, yeah, no, I knew this would take time. So in my head, I've already given it some extra real estate uh, in our evening. And I've been like, yeah, we're going to take some more time with this song and also with the next song, which is whatever that is. And that way you're just being realistic. And I think everyone's got different capacities. And so, you know, as you get to know yourself and you know your skills and you know your band skills, uh, you just want to kind of pace things accordingly and say, I, I, you know, I know that maybe it's only, maybe you can do one, you know, one complex arrangement uh, in a mm-hmm. rehearsal. And the other ones are going to be a little bit more straightforward. It's just, again, my... One of my favorite words is intentionality. Just being really intentional about thinking about that rehearsal, think, thinking about the arrangements and the complexity of them. Yeah. Well, I have to confess, as you're talking, I'm thinking about a few worship practices I had, even on the stage where you're on every week, uh, and it would be like 9:30, and I would realize, oh no, I just actually finished my second song, and I have four to go, <laughs> and there's 20 totally. minutes left because I got lost in my yeah. super complex vision for this one song and then everybody's looking at me and you get those awkward stares of I got a kid to put to bed and I got you know and oh it's mm-hmm. just like okay then we'll do this on Sunday morning and, and it just creates <laughs> stress. Yeah. It's yeah. right. So and you don't like it, I mean that feeling of <laughs> what's that? Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I mean I think that I, I think like it's just no one likes that feeling of, of panic, right? Or or that feeling of just like um, franticness. Like like you say, I've been there too, man, so many times and I think that's maybe why yeah. I've learned some of this is that you know, I just it's it's kind of a it's kind of a bad feeling when you're you're leaving the rehearsal and like, Oh, we did not get through like two out of the you know, out of the six songs yeah. and so Sunday morning I gotta make sure I'm ready to go and then you're going into Sunday morning, you're feeling really stressed about it and you're like, I hope okay, I, I hope that I got that right. I hope they listen to the stuff and I hope you know it's so much better to be like, no, I've, I've planned things accordingly, and I think we're, think we're in good hands here. We're in good shape. Yeah. Very good. Okay, next point. I think we're on to number five now. We're making great progress. So planning mm-hmm. for clear intros and outros. Right. Yes. I think this, to me, is one of those, I, I think it's just, it's a no-brainer um, I would, I would argue that it's maybe objective and not subjective. Like I think, I think we just need this. Um, you need to have uh, just a clear awareness of, of how things are going to start, how things are going to end. I've seen it too many times where maybe, uh, maybe younger band leaders, uh, greener band leaders, um, you know, they'll, they'll kind of just say, okay, so this song is, you know, here's, here's how it goes. And, and they'll just kind of start playing and slowly everyone kind of fades in and starts kind of catching on where they are. And then, you know, and then they do the song. And by the time the end of the song, it feels pretty good. It's like, yeah, we've got a good vibe here. And then suddenly they're on to the next song. And I'm like, whoa, hang on, hang on. Like, y- you guys, you do not know how you're starting the song yet. 
Like you're, you, you know, it, it's like it feels good three quarters of the way through because finally everyone's caught up. But we never actually established the intro here. We don't actually know how this is going to start. And so, and then, and then I've seen it too many times bite people back on when it's live, right? When it's Sunday morning. And I'm like, oh no, because they're kind of looking at each other and there's a bit of panic. And so then the, you know, the piano player might start playing and then the guitar sort of comes in, but he comes in at the wrong place. And because we never actually decided, here's how we're starting yeah. the song. Same with the endings, right? It's just, <laughs> it's those moments, which again, I'm sure we're all familiar with when it's like, here comes something and suddenly it's like, oh my word, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're doing here. I forget. I don't think we ever decided how to, how to end this, right? And <laughs> so I think it's, it's one of those really key musical things that is just so important. Make sure you know how you're going to start the song. And even if it is just a simple no-brainer start, maybe it's just if, like I lead from the piano, so it might just be where, hey, guys, I'm going to start this one. Uh, and actually, it's okay for you. You know what? As I come in, let's start with piano and acoustic. Um, bass guitar, uh, I wouldn't actually come in until you hear, you know, the vocals, that first verse. Why don't you come in on the downbeat in the first verse? Drums, you know, let's, let's mess around with it a little bit, but I think it's fine. Even if the drums come in halfway through the verse, that's cool. Or whatever. But again, you're just saying, you're giving some instruction for how that's going to go. And then, again, our congregation, like what we do on stage is always contagious, right? So mm -hmm. nervous people make people nervous. And <laughs> confident people make people feel confident. And so, if, yeah. you're leading with, if you're leading with confidence, people are going to feel like, okay, I'm in good hands. But if you're leading from a place of, of insecurity or a place of a little bit of nervousness because you don't know how this is going to go, you don't know where it's going, well, people feel like, oh, maybe I'm not in good hands here. I'm not sure. You know? So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, being really, really clear on our intros and outros is, is a super important thing. Yeah, really good. I'm just going to flip over to a question that Todd was asking. Sure. Do you pre-plan the song order of verses and choruses, or do you use hand signals and play it by ear during worship? Uh, so I'll assume that, that Todd is talking about, like in, in terms of the live worship um, yeah. sort of setting. Yeah. So what I do is, no, I typically will plan uh, verses and choruses. Like I'll plan kind of the order of that. But at the same time, I also will sometimes move away from that. And if I do that, I don't use hand gestures as much as I'll actually... Usually I'll verbally actually call it out. So, you know, let's say that I'm going to do that chorus again, even though we didn't rehearse it that way. Um, by the way, just to back up, I will often tell my band that. I'll say, hey, so this song, you know, I'm think we, we may actually do that chorus a couple times, but for now let's just, we'll just go straight to the bridge. Um, but there's a chance, so just watch for me. I do a lot of verbal, uh, sorry, a lot of um, kind of eye-to-eye -eye communication when, we're, when I'm leading. So I'll turn and look and mm -hmm. give people kind of a visual cue. But I'll also give people a verbal cue, both the congregation and the band, by saying, you know, so this is amazing. Sorry, I keep using this as amazing grace, but, you know, at the end of the That's song, amazing. all that I've done for you, is, and, and just kind of like, you know, yell, this is amazing grace, this is amazing, and it gives people, it gives the band actually a couple seconds to get that downbeat as well. Um, but so, yeah, no, I will often, I do plan out verses and choruses and kind of the order of the songs with room, though, to, uh, to change that up and actually just to, and I'll try to be really clear I think that's the key, is to be really clear when you do decide to change it up. Um, you know, verbally calling that out, um, or, yeah, that's, I usually verbally call it out. And, and again, I give kind of people a look uh, on the band, if, uh, in, on the stage there, if we are going to repeat something or do something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to communicating the direction of a song, the real important thing is, do you have a way of clearly communicating with your band members? So if it's hand signals, then great. And then, you know, do yeah. they know what three fingers or two fingers or one finger or the fist or the, you know, everybody has their own kind of unique thing. If you have a guitar, some people like if they lift their guitar fretboard or lower it, it means different things. You can create whatever language you want. Just make sure that your band knows and, and maybe talk about it. You know, like when I do this, this is what I mean. And, uh, and yep. then I really agree, Corey, that sometimes there's just nothing wrong with a very clear vocal signal that everybody can hear, even the congregation, that everybody knows yep. where you're going, and it leads to uh, confidence. Like, I know where we're going, and we're going to go there, and we're going to all be together, and I, my voice isn't going to stick out because I started singing the chorus, and you were going into a quiet verse or, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So. So that's really and, good. Some, I, and I think that some songs lend themselves easier than other songs to doing, like to being a bit more spontaneous. Like, 
it's it's one thing to hit, you know, as you're ending a chorus, uh, you know, if the decision is if you're gonna if you're gonna repeat the chorus, you're gonna hit the same chord that you would normally hit at the end, as opposed to if you're going to a bridge and that's gonna be a whole new chord. Suddenly, it that then there's a lot more potential for a train wreck, right? If you're like, oh, um, yeah. you know, suddenly it's like I have to decide which chord I'm gonna hit here. So it part of it again is just thinking through that, um, even sometimes in the moment, right? It's like, well, this we could actually totally repeat that chorus and no one's gonna get messed up because we're actually landing on the same chord. Either way, right? So we're okay if I just vocally start beating that. So yeah, totally, I agree. I think people Very good. start to get your uh, your language together. So okay, number six, set the vibe right from the beginning. What were you meaning by that? Mm-hmm. So I feel as though um, my my kind of philosophy when I when I lead uh, a band is that from the moment I step into our worship center for the rehearsal night and I see you know, a few of the musicians getting warmed up, uh, they're tuning up or whatever, I feel like um, I take responsibility for the vibe of the rehearsal in terms of just the, the mood of things. Um, and maybe I'll start off by saying sort of a, a negative example of this could be where, and I've seen this before, and often more with, again, younger or greener leaders, where, you know, if I'm observing the rehearsal, I see the, the band leader, and maybe, you know, maybe he or she's in the corner um, hanging out and just like kind of laughing and joking with, with one, of their, one or two of their friends that are also in the band, uh, and just kind of doing their thing, and you know, it's a bit of a clique thing happening. And meanwhile, you've got the, you know, the poor drummer over there and the guitarist who's just kind of standing there and tuning, because that's what you do when you feel like you have nothing else to do and you're kind of out of it. So you, you know, tuning his guitar, and you know, and I can tell already that there's a bit of a sense of, uh, there's not a sense of family, right? There's not a sense that we're doing this together. There's, it's more like, well, this person, the band leader's comfortable with those three people, but not as much with the others. And so, anyways, that's a that's a kind of a specific example, but. For me, I make a point of, um, of actually like hanging out a little bit with the band beforehand. And even if that's just a sentence or two, just making a point of actually kind of greeting each musician um, and asking questions about the maybe stuff that I know from, you know, hey, how's your mom? I heard she was in the hospital, right? Like, is she doing okay? And yeah, okay, okay I'm glad to hear that. Hey, man, I'm so glad you're here. It's going to be fun this weekend. That's it, you know. But, but again, what I'm doing is I'm making a point of saying, like, you matter more to me than the role that you're filling this weekend. Like you, right. you and I are actually, we have a relationship outside of this as well. And so it's just setting the mood, um, setting the, the tone of family together. We're, we're doing this together. We've got a, a, a mission that we're actually going to accomplish together, all six or seven of us, including the sound tech, including the media tech and lighting tech, whoever that is. Um, we're all doing this together. We've got a common goal. And so let's make sure that we're setting a tone that feels as though we're all invited into this. It's not just, you know, a cold kind of task thing that we're doing, but we're, we're going to do it together. So, yeah, I make a point of talking to each musician, uh, each, you know, whoever the tech uh, people are, uh, just greeting them ahead of time, asking how they're doing. Yep, starting things off in a good Great. kind of, yeah, good vibe. I keep having that word ringing in me about be intentional. Everything seems to come back to this for me, that you're thoughtful, you're intentional, you're not just, it's not just happening, Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're, you're thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it and all of that. So totally. really good. Yep. Well, Corey, lots of questions are coming in, and I think we're going to have time to get to a number of them here. So, uh, so Robin sure. is asking, and you can just shoot from the hip answering these. I know you didn't really prepare for this, but uh, here we go. Does yep. everyone just jump in and practice at the same time, or do you have separate times for vocals, instrumentals, things like that? What's your experience with that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think, again, I would say, and there's that word intentional again, I would say typically what we do is we have one rehearsal, and that includes um, vocals and it includes um, instrumentalists, and we do a rehearsal together. But I've also been in many situations, and I've led many situations where we've deliberately separated them. Uh, our, typically on a Sunday morning, I have myself, let's say I'm leading worship, and usually like one other vocalist, maybe two other vocalists. Um, but because our vocal arrangements aren't typically really complex, and that's intentional on my part. I, I'm not a huge fan of, of really complex vocal arrangements. Actually, not that I'm a fan. We just don't do it a lot. Um, then I don't, I don't feel too concerned about making sure that we you know, have a separate rehearsal. However, if we do have, like we have a big event coming up called Making Spirits Bright, and it's, um, it's our big kind of Christmas production. That's going to have lots of, complex vocal arrangements. For that, we're probably going to have a number of separate rehearsals um, because of the fact that we just, just the arrangements call for it. We just have to, we got to do it that way. Or it's, you know, again, being intentional, trying to make sure that we all, we get as much bang for our buck out of people's mm-hmm. time. People are busy. Yep. We've got families. And 
So, but no, typically on a, for a Sunday morning we have one rehearsal. Uh, again, I'll just add this. Um, part of the, the bar that we've set at our church is that if you're a vocalist, uh, you, I'm going to know ahead of time that you can actually do a pretty good job and a pretty quick job of picking up harmonies uh, when they're needed without a lot of work in the rehearsal time. So that's, that's one of the things too, right? You have to have a, a level of, of musicality that you can do that, and that's, that's where we're at right now. So. Yeah, yeah, really good. Okay, Jim asks, at what point during a rehearsal do you decide that a song just isn't working and decide to bail? How does this impact your Sunday planning if that song was the key song to a worship set? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've had that uh, a few times for sure. Um, I think that, yeah, I think you know. Like, I think there, there have been times, um, it's, it's been a little while now, and I think, as, again, as you get more and more experience doing something, I think you, hopefully you get a, a you know, better awareness of how things are going to go and what's realistic and what isn't realistic. But there have been times for sure when it's like, you know, this somehow, this isn't working. Um, it's pretty rare that I've abandoned a song. What I've done, though, is I've abandoned my idea for the arrangement. Like, I've, I've been like, you know what? We got, this is a great, especially if Jim, as Jim's saying, like, you know, if we're, that's a pretty key song for the, for the morning. Um, I don't feel like that option is a good one to, to abandon the song, unless it's horrible, unless we just cannot get it. Um, mm -hmm. In that case, I would have in my back pocket um, a really simple arrangement of it, something that we can definitely, we can pull off that's not going to be too complex. Um, so that would be my short answer. If there was, like, if it was a song that's actually not simple, just, just the way that it's made, Let's say it's a Gettys tune, <laughs> you know, or something that's a bit more involved, or like a, you know, I'm thinking of Israel Houghton or something, where it's like, Ooh, okay, this, there's no real super simple arrangement of this. Then, yeah, then there might come a point where it's like, you know, we've spent 40 minutes on this, we've, we're already getting close to the, you know, the time, we, we're, we still have three songs to go. Then, then at that point, maybe you just have to say, you know what, guys, honestly, I think we need to leave this. Like, I think we need to, uh, that might be a, a moment where I'd say, leave this with me, let's go on to the next songs, I'm going to, I'm going to think this through for Sunday. I'm going to talk to you know our lead pastor about it, and uh, and it probably be one of those things where like, hey, we're going to put a, we're going to put a simple song in there instead, and we're just going to have to try this mm -hmm. again some other week. Yeah, That's, I think there's something to be said for the band knowing that you're going to take them to the stage feeling confident on Sunday, mm -hmm. and as a leader, you're gonna you're gonna lead that, and you know it's almost like they need to trust you to take them there. But when you are on stage you're all going to feel confident and you're not going to like expose them to some embarrassment on stage. Nobody wants to, to be in a position like that, right? So That's uh, great and, and maybe, yeah. you know, goes for saying that uh, if you practice on a Wednesday or a Thursday, you have a few days to recontemplate, you know, what does it take that we could show up on Sunday morning and feel confident because that's going to lead to uh, you know a more genuine heartfelt expression of, of worship that's not so focused on the technicalities or the embarrassment of you know missing playing something you truly can't and uh, you know not trying to show up on Sunday morning and being a superstar pulling off that no. Israel Houghton you know super song that you're just not ready for and and uh, so I think there's something to be said for that so. That's great. I, I think that's a great, uh, a great word, Ryan. Like, for sure, I think yeah. the more that you can earn as a leader, again, back to the leadership thing, the more that you can earn uh, your band's trust. Like, I hope that my team yeah. trust me to not, like you say, not embarrass them or to, to be setting us all up to win. That's a really key. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really key yeah. factor, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Well, let's move to the next point. We'll take a few more questions as we go through. You're doing great, Corey. I'm shooting, you know, people are asking, like, Real practical, you know, meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts, if you want to call it, questions. And I, I like this. I like the practicality of, of all of this. So learning the language of your musicians, what are you thinking when you say that? Yeah, you know, I think this is something that early on I discovered is just it's helpful. And it's funny, in a way for me, it was almost like, Corey, be willing to look foolish in the way that you're talking if, if it's going to accomplish what you want it to accomplish. And so... I remember like, you know, our drummer's kind of laughing at me as I'm like imitating what I want the drums to sound like. So, you know, I'm like, hey, could you do like a, like a, and they're kind of like, what are you doing, man? Like, you know, it's just kind of weird. <laughs> I think, I think the team's pretty comfortable with it now because I do it all the time. But, but it's just, it's finding a language that will help people 
understand what you're looking for from them. Like, it doesn't do anyone any good if you're saying to the guitarist, um, yeah, like, you know, I like, yeah, it's good. I just, it's not, I was thinking something different. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> that doesn't help, right? It's like, okay, you're thinking something different. So, but if you could say, hey, you know, that's cool. Like, I was actually thinking of something more aggressive. Like, do you have any, could you put them to some distortion on that? And I'm thinking actually instead of melody stuff, could you give us some, some crunchy power chords? Like, like I'm kind of hearing something really aggressive, almost kind of angry sounding. Do you have anything like that? Like, and they'll do it, you know, and then being really picky about it and be like, ah, it's close. It feels like, I think even more, like how a just big wall of sound, like something muscular and crunchy and just aggressive, you know. And so, I mean, it's kind of funny, but right away the guitarist, as I'm talking, he's, he's getting it. He knows what I'm talking about. I'm looking for something that's, that's strong, that's probably distorted, that's like kind of big and in your face, like, it's just using that kind of language that really helps people to, to kind of get what you're trying to describe. I'm not a great, I can, I can hack on the acoustic guitar, but I'm not a, I'm not a great guitarist. But I think that I, I've learned how to hopefully help people understand what I'm looking for. And even if you're being specific and saying, you know, hey, do you know that song, uh, you know, for me, it's like, do you know that song by Emmylou Harris? Uh, like, I just love the tone, that one Red Dirt Girl, you know, the guitar, it's, got this, it's really kind of vibey and it's got a bit of grit to it, but it's got some delay in there and reverb, like something that's really kind of far off sounding and, you know, and we're kind of going back and forth and, and find, it's like, yeah, 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 that's it, right there, that's the one. Could you do that? Like, that sounds so great. Um, so just finding, uh, finding the ability to speak the language and, you know, of, of, uh, of the musician and helping them understand what you're looking for as opposed to generalities where you're like, you know, I don't know, just something a little different, like maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, I, just, <laughs> I think because I hear that often uh, in, in, in uh, rehearsals that I, you know, where I'm observing, I just, I feel like, oh, that's, I, don't think, I don't think you're setting that person up to win. I don't think they have a clue what you're asking for. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I would say, Ryan, there's that word again, being intentional, even ahead of time, mm -hmm. thinking, what am I imagining? What am I imagining for the guitarist in this song? Like, what am I, what's my dream for this song? You know, like, if, if by the end of the song, it's like, that was exactly how I imagined it. What would that sound like? What would the drummer be doing? How would the, like, what would the, the vibe of the song feel like? Um, you know, and even just using, like, this last weekend, we did You Alone Can Rescue, and I mean, this is a small example, but I was like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, drummer, so let's use... Um, brushes. I'm picturing actually like a gentle bluegrass kind of feel. So right away, gentle bluegrass kind of feel. Well, we're thinking kind of a, you know, it's going to be a cut time, but it's going to be using brushes. So I think right away people have an idea, oh yeah, okay, I think I see probably where this is going. Uh, and then I'll play a bit on the piano and we kind of work it out. So anyways, I think just the idea is, is thinking through how will you communicate what it is you're looking for um, without just using kind of general, general terms. Yeah, that's good. I think as worship uh, leaders, you don't have to know how to play all the instruments in your band, but you do have to know how to communicate with all the musicians in your band. And, and it, it might take a little pre-study to be like, so what, you know, what does a bass player actually do? You know, uh, what kind of sounds does he make? You know, slap, pick. Totally. You got to learn some language there and, uh, and then learn about you know, when the eyes light up with your drummer and he's going, yeah, I get it. Well, then totally you're speaking his language. So very good. Okay, number eight, yeah. learn the art of selfless playing. Yeah, yeah, this is that, um, did we talk about, uh, maybe we didn't even, I don't know if this is part of it or not, but like the, uh, I've, said, I've said before, like, you know, the, the greatest players, um, they can play it yeah. all, but they rarely do. Yes, um, that was a good. And this quote. idea that you get, you have amazing musicians. When you see like an amazing, um, you know, musician, I'm not talking jazz here because jazz often they, they do play it all. <laughs> but you know, in, in terms of our, <laughs> you know, worship yeah. context and pop context and what usually what we're, what our churches are about, um, like musically, it's you just have these great musicians, and when you hear what they're doing, they actually will often leave a lot of space. Um, and it's a, to me, it's a mark of a, of a really mature musician, someone that's willing to be selfless in their playing as opposed to selfish in their playing. And so um, even though in that moment, and we've all been there, like I know I've been there, and I have to, I still fight this myself when we're, we're playing, and, you know, and it's just a great chord progression, it's a great key, and I'm like, oh, like I know I could just, I feel like I could just fly with this, you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it, it, it's not going to serve the song, right? It's actually going to take away from the song. It's going to saturate the song. So instead, actually, I would rather compliment what's going on and just think through how can I be... Yeah, how can I really serve um, the song here, um, musically speaking? And so, uh, yeah, just being selfless about it. I think, 
And it's often, again, I think it's, it's when you're, maybe, maybe when you have greener musicians or younger musicians that are learning how to play and they're, and they're actually, their chops are coming up, they're doing really well, they're getting better and better. I think the, yeah, the temptation is just to be like, oh man, I could fly on this. And so, and so they do, right? Um, and they're, they're playing like just really, really busy and, and everything's like there's, there's uh, eighth notes everywhere and arpeggios everywhere. And, and it's just like, hey, 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 you know, I think like if you did, if you did like, you know, a third of that, it would be great. You know, like just pull back. We need to give some room here. Like there's, there's six of us. The more musicians that you have, typically the less you're going to play. That's a good kind of rule of thumb, right? So, yep. yeah, I think the art of selfless playing is something that develops over time, but let's, as band leaders, let's just keep encouraging our musicians to be, yeah, thinking, you know, think of space. Space matters as much as the notes. So we want to be uh, really careful about that and really intentional about that. Yeah. I think as a worship leader, you have to, you have to teach that. You have, it's almost like you have to sit down and go, okay, guys, you know, even beyond this specific song that we're doing here, this is a you know a character quality that we want to develop as a as a band and, and you know it, that way you're not singling any one person out but just just uh, developing that maturity in your in your band members and that that outlook so that's really good. So I got a question you know, just, from. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yep. You want me to go? I'll go. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say the, I would just add to that like I think. Uh, this is maybe a, a, a no-brainer kind of thing too, but like um, it's always just so important as a leader to be, like you just kind of touched on it now, but to be really, really careful about how you're communicating to your team. Like when, you, when I say be a leader, be a strong leader, like that's really important, but, but you never ever want to be like a dictator, <laughs> kind of abusive yeah. leader, right? You want to you wanna be really careful how you're saying things and not dishonor someone or embarrass them in front of their peers, right? Because that's, that's the worst thing, especially, you know, music is such a vulnerable thing. So just being really careful about saying like, hey, you know what, I, I think that's cool what you're doing. Do you think like, I'm, it feels a little bit dizzy. Like I wonder if you could maybe just, you know, pull back a little bit and, you know, using that kind of softer language is actually helpful and, it, and it's not disempowering. It's not dishonoring anyone. It's just sort of saying, here's what we're looking for. Um, I still value you. It's, you know, it's not like you did bad. It's just we're just trying to find the best outcome here. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Just be careful with your language. That's good. Okay, one more question, and then we've got one more point, and we're uh, we're pulling out the landing gear here, Corey. This has been really great. So Craig asks, how do you lead a group that has a wide range of age and musicianship? My worship band includes adults and youth from age 13 to 60, and a wide span of musical abilities. Any tips for keeping it accessible but not boring? Oh yeah, that's great. That's a great question. Um, I think, yeah, like to some degree, so uh, this, yeah, I, I, I'm not a black and white kind of guy. I would say to some degree, though, you, you are stuck a little bit with the lowest common denominator, um, but it doesn't mean that it has to be uh, bad or, or like, you know, overly simple or anything. I think that you have to work with, you know, your, um, depending on who, obviously, and, and to be honest, it will depend on who the musician is. Like if you've got, let's say your weakest musician is a drummer, that's actually a far bigger deal than if your weakest musician is a bass guitarist, in my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I always, to be honest, my thought is that if, you, if I had to pick on the stage, if I had to pick who's going to be the weakest musician, I would actually probably say I'll take the bass guitarist as the weakest musician. Because in my mind, at least in the, in the genre that we're playing and in the context that we're playing, if we can get those, you know, the, the kind of the root notes that we need, obviously it's so great to have a great bass guitarist, but... Um, but yeah, that's going to change things. If it's a really, really weak drummer, well, then that really will limit you in terms of what you can do and what you can't do. Um, mm-hmm. So I would say, like, yeah, I would say think through, try to, whatever you're doing, do it well. And so maybe it's going to be like, yeah, I, I got I to gotta do a pretty simple arrangement here because we do have, you know, our drummer or this person is, is quite weak and I know that they'll, they'll have some difficulty being able to get there with this. Um, but I would, also, I would also be trying to push them, uh, even, even like take them aside afterwards and encourage them and say, hey, you know what, I see, like, I, I think you're doing great. I see a lot more in you. I, I would love to see you, uh, you know, work on this and this. And even by Sunday, man, I feel like that one section, you could do, like, you could take that up a notch. And man, I think people love to be pushed. I think they love to grow and they love to be believed in. And so I guess, mm. yeah, maybe the short answer is, yeah, you've got to work with what you have. And so that might mean a little bit of a simpler arrangement. And then it might also mean talking to some of the more experienced players and encouraging them to encourage the greener players and say, like, afterwards, say, hey, listen, 
thanks so much for your. You're doing awesome, and I really appreciate you doing this. Like you're, you're great. Hey, if you can, you know, encourage, uh, you know, Bob there. He's, he's, he's new at this, and I, you know, I'd love for us to be taking this up a level. And he's still, he's still working on it. But man, the more you can encourage him, I think it just, it, it really makes him fly. You know, when you do that. And so, I don't know, kind of working together. Um, maybe it's starting off that way, but I think there's, man, there's no greater joy than when you see uh, a young green musician over time start to develop in, in their musicianship because of the people that they're playing with who are always lovingly challenge, challenging them further, calling them further musically. Man, it's a great thing. And then, you know, suddenly it's like, hey, you, you did awesome. That was so good. Like, way to go. And we've come a long way together. Sorry, that's kind of a long, random spread. Sorry. Answer, but I, yeah, I think it's good. It's, it's really good. Okay, last point, really, really practical, nuts and bolts like, but uh, watch out for competing melodies. That was your number nine. Right, yeah. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this maybe ties in in a way with some of the other points, but <clears throat> we have, like, so for instance, we have a, a team with a violinist, uh, a lead guitarist, a uh, piano player, that's, that's me often, <clears throat> maybe an accordion player, depending on the, on the Sunday. Suddenly you've got, you've got these four instruments, let alone vocalists, that have the capacity and the potential to be playing melodies. Um, I think, again, it's, just, it's really important to be very careful about having too many melodies going on at once. Um, so I will often, not that we can't have it, I know that there's, there's definitely room for having a few different melodies happening, and you know, our lead guitarist will sometimes, you know, at the last chorus, we're ripping it up, and it's a big song, and he's, suddenly he's like soloing over top as we're singing. Um, and sometimes that's great, but sometimes it's too much. Like sometimes I'm like, you know, I don't want, I don't want a lot of competing melodies with, with the actual melody of what we're singing. Um, you know, or our violinist maybe, I'll, I'll say to our violinist, you know, this, this is a great chorus. I would love to have you, like I really want the melodies, you know, to shine here and actually be like the only thing that's going, not, not to have other melodies that are competing with it. Maybe at the end of the phrase you could do something, you know, so if you, we, we finish that phrase, you kind of fill it in and we do the next phrase and you're out, but then fill it in at the end of the phrase. Um, just because, you know, sometimes what happens is like if everyone's playing um, a really great sounding melody at the same time, we're, it's just suddenly it's really complex and it's, it's, it's a little bit cluttered, it's a little bit messy, uh, and it doesn't sound, it's just not a good clean sound. It's not what we're looking for. So, um, so yeah, I'm always trying to be very aware of that, especially when you have melody instruments, like more than one melody instrument playing. So I would just be very watchful of that and very intentional about how you're kind of uh, planning that arrangement and then speak into it too, like when it's happening, say, hey, you know what, uh, Lisa, that sounds great. Could you, let's get you to, to maybe actually in the, in the course there, could you pull out and maybe just come in at the end of that phrase just so we're not having more than one kind of melody happening here at the same time. Really good, really good. Well, uh, lots of questions have come in. In fact, more than, more than normal, I think people are really being lit up by this whole topic and, uh, and you've been very practical very uh, insightful, Corey. So thanks for all that you have been sharing with us. I have this thought that we're going to formally wrap up our time here, and then afterwards we'll just do a little bit of informal chat for maybe five minutes. There's a few people chatting on the sidebar, and we can answer a few quick questions, things like that. But I sure. uh, just wanted to thank you, Corey, for taking the time with us. This is you know Tuesday morning. I know it's a big day for a lot of worship pastors as they're getting ready for a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday rehearsals and heading into the week. And hopefully this can be an encouragement to many of you listening in. I do want to encourage you about Corey's album. It's a real sort of demonstration of Corey's heart for worship. Uh, he's very much, uh, I, you can almost tell that Corey doesn't like to think just linearly and you know, he's got uh, many thoughts going on, even theologically. He's wrestling with some things. You know, I'm, for sure the album is theologically sound and pure, but it's not simple answer kind of songs. These are songs that wrestle with, with difficult, you know, life themes that go on. And so uh, I hope that you can use some of those in your, in your churches. So that's all found at praystarts.com forward slash lost and found. And again, there's the, the videos. You can hear the stories behind some of the songs and, and all of that. So, so thanks, Corey. Hey, Corey, at the end of these webinars, I often like to invite my guests to pray for those of us who are listening in. So would you do that? Would you just lead us in prayer 
for um, all the worship leaders and pastors who are listening in, and they got worship practices this week. Let's just pray for this week that there'd be something that would light up and uh, and be an encouragement for them. Totally, yeah. I'd be so happy. I'll give it Thank you so much, Ryan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Heavenly Father, we're just, uh, I'm just so thankful that, um, that we can gather together like this online. Uh, thanks for technology mm-hmm. and uh, the ability to do this. And uh, Lord, I do want to pray for all the, the different worship leaders that are, that are on right now with us. Um, God, the, the musicians, um, Lord, we, uh, we're wanting mm-hmm. to, uh, to honor you and to lift you up. We wanted to honor our communities that we're leading worship for. God, I pray that you would um, help each person here and each family that's represented as well, Lord, that you would... Um, God, show them your favor as they are preparing for, uh, for worship this week. God, give us uh, creativity. Thank you that you are uh, the ultimate creator, but you allow us to be creative and to use um, the beautiful things that you've made um, to bring honor to you and to uh, encourage our brothers and sisters in our different churches. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. Lord, I want to lift up each person that is here, God. Would you, would you bless us this week and watch over us, God? Help uh, mm-hmm. what uh, we want you to experience and to be blessed by uh, what you see us uh, being about here in our churches. So mm-hmm. uh, we lift you up, Jesus. Thank you so much for the Amen. way you've been generous towards Thank us and loving towards us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Great. So just to recap, we are going to post this whole webinar onto YouTube. Uh, it should be there, if not by the end of today, by tomorrow morning at uh, the Alstead webinar link that you're looking at, praisestarts.com forward slash Alstead webinar. I'm just thinking that today in particular, there have been such great points. I'm going to list the points on that page, and we'll also post a link to this PowerPoint. So you could take it and you know show Corey's beautiful face to all of your worship teams and, and members if you like, or you could delete those pictures from the PowerPoint and make it your own. And uh, what do you think, Corey? Would that be okay? <laughs> oh, absolutely, totally. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> so, so people can uh, we'll make we'll make the PowerPoint available, and you can use it or you know delete some points or whatever it is. Share it with your teams, and uh, and hopefully that's an encouragement to you. So. So that's the end of our formal time together. And now we get just a little informal time. Uh, There's some chat going on at the end. There's a few questions, and I didn't want to leave anybody out uh, too much. So if some of you have some comments or things, Corey, you can just kind of watch the, the, um, the chat side right now. Barry's asking, how many weeks in advance do you plan the services, and how do you work with the the passage and topic of the sermon. What's your experience, Corey? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Barry. Um, so for me, we uh, I would love to say that we are like um, way further along uh, than we are. <laughs> so we we're <laughs> typically it'd be like you know two weeks out, uh, but really specifically, it's the week of like we're we don't. I mean, we plan ahead for for certain you know the bigger services like Easter and and. Uh, you know, for the season of Advent and Christmas, obviously. But, but typically, it's, it's, you know, we definitely know the topics a couple of weeks out, um, and I'll start to be thinking about songs and stuff, but it's usually actually the week, like mo- the Monday. Uh, again, I want to get better at this, by the way. This is something that I, I want to grow in, is, is just getting stuff ahead of time. I always work well under pressure, so usually by Monday, I'll have the songs, hopefully by Monday, I'll have the songs up, or at least most of the songs up for that week, after talking with Matthew, our lead pastor, um, oh, working with the topic and the passage. Uh, I, you know, for me, I think it's really important. I don't necessarily pick every single song. In fact, I don't pick every song according to the topic or the passage for the Sunday. Um, I'll talk with my, again, a lot of this is just talking with our lead pastor about it. And I will like, say, hey, so you know, definitely a response song is something that I'm going to be thinking about. Kind of, hey, Matthew, where, like, where are you ending this Sunday? What's, kind of the, what's the main point? And, um, and maybe even to start off the sermon, I might pick a song that really kind of leads us into that place. If, it's, you know, if, if we're talking about confession or if we're talking about you know, it's a, just a message on grace, well, I'm going to pick songs that really speak to that. Um, but at the same time, I'm also big into saying at the beginning of the service, I, I like to try to find a call to worship, like a song that's more of an invocation and a welcoming people in, welcoming, um, you know, like, or, or just saying, God, we want you to come and meet with us. Songs that, that do that well, um, that aren't necessarily on topic for that Sunday, but I think, I think that's okay. So anyway, short answer is that I usually would pick that's one or good. two songs that are bookending the sermon. Yeah. Okay, I love Barry Jocelyn just has a classic comment. He says, Corey, that's a relief. I thought I was a slacker. I am working to get <laughs> two to three weeks out myself. It's just impossible sometimes. So, 
So totally. there you go. You're yeah. encouraging all the slacker worship leaders out there that, you know, they're, they're better <laughs> than they think they are. <laughs> That's exactly. And, yeah. Lee's got a good question here. Okay. See, go ahead. Uh, read it Lee out. Soto. Yeah, so Lee is asking, how do you deal with team members resistant to being led? Huh. Like, to be honest, I guess for me, I don't feel like I'm a pretty relational leader. I'm not like a dictator kind of guy, but that would be a, that would be a deal breaker for me, to be honest. Um, I feel as though, like, it's, and no matter, and I don't mean necessarily, you know, it's not, this is not about Corey, you know, like I want everyone to, to be listening to Corey at all. It's more the role and the, the principle of it. Um, so I would just say if someone was resistant to being led, I would definitely have a pretty serious conversation with them about it. And I've had that before, um, you know, where I've sensed just someone who's being, you know, just, just a little bit inappropriate or disrespectful uh, to the leader, whether it's me or whether it's someone else. And, and I'll just say, look, here's the deal. Like, it's not, we're not saying that this person is the best musician. We're not saying that this person is anything other than the, the leader role. We've given this person the role of leader. And, and if, that's that, if that's me, then I'll probably walk through even what we've talked about today. Look, I've, you got to know there's lots of good answers here, and I have to pick one of them. That's, that's the job that I've been given, and so I'm going to do it. And I actually need for you, like I really need for you to actually go with that. And if you can't, then maybe there's a better place for you to serve in the church. Like maybe there's another place that you're able to be submissive. Um, I just think, yeah, I think submission is actually a big deal for all of us, you know. I'm submissive mm-hmm. to, to my lead pastor. Uh, we, I think we all need to be submissive to whoever the leader is. Can I, let me just add one mm-hmm. quick little thing here about that. I, mm-hmm. Like I sometimes play with different musicians that, you know, outside of our church, and one friend of mine that I play with is a great musician, and often I'm playing for him. And so he'll be directing me and saying, hey, I want you to do this. Can you do this? And not that. Yeah, actually, don't, uh, don't play in that verse there. Why don't you come in here? And, and so for me, my role is to serve what, what he, the song that he's leading, and he's the guy who's in charge. So I'm like, yep, you bet, so I'll do that. But then there's also times when actually I'm leading, and he's playing with me. And in that case, it's the exact opposite. And that's when I'm saying to him, hey, actually, you know what? Can you not play there? I'd like you to play here. And he's like, yep, totally. Because we understand, look, the roles have changed now. And now in this context, I'm kind of leading the thing. In that context, you're leading it. So, yeah, I think it's important to, to have that conversation and to set up, you know, this is important to, uh, we all submit to, uh, to our leadership. Yeah, really good. Well, the questions keep coming, but we're going to have to, you know, draw it to a close. Uh, sure. So, I just want to let you all know that I heard from Charlene. She's already got all the points uh, at the uh, webinar page, which is praisecircle.com forward slash Alstad webinar. They're already there. The YouTube isn't fully loaded yet, but uh, if you want to grab that, and in a, in very shortly we'll have the PowerPoint available. So I think a lot of people are going to find this to be a great, uh, great resource. Thanks, Corey. I'm sure you've got cool. a hey, thanks day, so the much. rest of your day. It was a great time. You did really great and very practical, very insightful, and, you know, with a little bit of heart in there as well, because I know your heart is really in a great place for, for leading people, and you do have a heart of humility and, and servanthood, and uh, it really shines through. So I appreciate you a ton. Thank you, everyone who has been listening in. Thank you for being so engaged and asking lots of questions, making it like a community coming together and just trying to sort out, you know, how can we be better at this? Uh, We really care about you guys as worship pastors at Praise Charts. We're not just like selling charts. You know, we we care about the worship ministry. I I really kind of feel the pulse of being a worship pastor and coming alongside with other worship pastors like Corey and figuring out, you know, now that you've got the music, say, from Praise Charts or wherever you get it from, now what do you do with it? And so uh, that's why we do these, these webinars, to, to just really get into the heart and soul of this ministry. So that's what we care about. So we're glad to serve you. Thank you very much. Please visit the Allstad webinar um, page to get all the resources. And don't forget, you can stream Corey's full album. It's all online. All the chord charts are free, so you can download those. And uh, I hope that's an encouragement to you all. Thanks, Corey. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, everyone. It's been great to hang out with you online. God God bless you. See you then. You too. See ya. All right.